Hey, hi, everybody. I'm Erin, and we're going to be talking about vaginal birth after cesarean or VBAC. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a pelvic and orthopedic physical therapist at a critical access hospital in northern New Hampshire. I work in mainly the outpatient setting, and um, we're starting an acute postpartum program as well. So <clears throat> I have this picture of myself <laughs> and my children because this is the reason why I'm presenting about this and the reason why I became a pelvic physical therapist. So I'm a mom of three and my first birth was a cesarean and I've had two VBACs. So my first birth um, was at my local hospital who has a VBAC ban. And for some reason I was aware of this, even though this was my first birth and I didn't even know what a VBAC was. I think I had to look it up. And I had no intention on having a cesarean, as I think many first time parents do. You know, I, I really expect everything to go smoothly, picture perfect. And I remember wheeling back to the OR and thinking, I'm going to have a VBAC for my next birth. <laughs> um, and from that point on, I started doing research and worked really hard to understand the background of VBAC and understand why I even wanted one. So we'll talk a little bit more about my story as we go on and a lot more about VBAC. So the goals for this presentation are for ther therapists and practitioners and parents um, supporting clients planning a VBAC or repeat cesarean to better understand their clients' decision-making process, challenges that involve um, that surround having a birth after a cesarean, and then the risks and benefits of their choices. And then also to better support these parents in knowledge and not fear. So we also cannot talk about VBAC without talking about all of the abbreviations that go along with VBAC. So the ones that you'll most commonly see are TOLAC, which is a trial of labor after cesarean, and VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean. It's a matter of preference. Um, I have seen most providers choose to use the word TOLAC when the parent is pregnant um, and planning a VBAC, and then VBAC after the birth. Um, Many parents prefer VBAC. Um, they find it more positive and TOLAC feels like, well, I'm trying, but it might not work. I know I personally preferred to say that I was planning a VBAC. Then you'll also see VBA2C, VBA3C, and so on. And that's a vaginal birth after two, three plus cesareans. Another term for that is VBAMC, which is a vaginal birth after multiple cesareans. Next, you'll see HBAC which is a home birth after cesarean, which would be a vaginal birth, of course. And then CBAC and RCS mean essentially the same thing, but again, it's a matter of preference with language. With CBAC, you have a cesarean birth after cesarean, and then RCS is a repeat cesarean section. So some myths that I'm hoping to dispel as well with this presentation. So once a cesarean, always a cesarean, that VBAC is illegal that VBACs cannot be induced, and that VBACs are more risky than repeat cesarean sections. So some history on VBACs, because it gives us context on to why this can be somewhat of a controversial topic. So the cesarean rate in the US began to rise in the 70s. By the 80s and 90s, the VBAC rate increased. And by the mid 1990s, TOLAC was encouraged for most. Um, by 1998, it peaked to 28% of um, VBACs. VBAC rate, sorry. With the push for VBAC, there were an increase in complications. Many of these VBACs were medically induced and they utilize techniques that are now considered contraindicated. With these complications, medical malpractice lawsuits um, increased and that led to a decline in support. ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is a um, large body that oversees OBGYNs, added a requirement at the time that anesthesia be immediately available for all supporting VBAC, which eliminated the support of VBAC at hospitals that don't offer this 24 seven anesthesia report, like the hospital that I birthed in and the hospital I work in. So by 20, 2004, the VBAC rate dropped to 9.2% from that 28% in 1998. And up to 44% of US hospitals banned VBACs, whether this was an official ban or if this was a de facto ban where they just did not support them. By in 2010, ACOG decided to change their anesthesia requirement. However, there continues to be high malpractice insurance premiums, which to this day does affect the support of VBACs. So the current state of VBACs and cesareans in the United States. So currently, then the most recent number I could find was 2021. The cesarean rate was 32.1%, comparing that to 20.7% in 1996. The highest cesarean rate in the country was in Mississippi 
at 38.5%, and the low cesarean rate was in Utah. The VBAC rate in the in the U.S. in 2020 was 14%, so the repeat cesarean rate in 2020 was 86%. Again, much lower than what we were seeing in the late 90s. So I want to be clear that the cesarean rate shouldn't be 0%. There is always a, there are reasons for a cesarean section. Um, we do think that the cesarean section rate is quite high, but there's always going to be those indications. So placenta abnormalities like placenta previa and the accreta spectrum, which we'll talk more about later, parental preference, umbilical cord prolapse, transverse positioning of fetus, non-reassuring fetal status, whether in labor or prior to labor, history of uterine rupture and dehiscence, uh, maternal risks, including cardiac and pulmonary, and then when the risk of vaginal birth outweighs the benefit, and this is a conversation between the provider and their client. There are reasons why people make these choices, and most parents will be given a choice. Um, sometimes there are things that contraindicate a vaginal birth, and there's not much choice there. But when there is a choice, here are some reasons that they, they might choose a VBAC or a repeat cesarean section. So for a VBAC, they may feel that this is the safer choice for mom and baby. They may want to experience vaginal birth and may want a large family. With a repeat cesarean section, they may feel as well that this is the safer choice for mom and baby. They may enjoy the ability to plan better for their date of birth. This is likely their second, third, fourth child, and it's nice to be able to plan childcare. <laughs> they may feel that they know what to expect as well, which is comforting. And on the more negative potentially standpoint, they may also feel lack of pressure um, or, or they may feel pressure or lack of support for VBAC. So we'll talk more about some risks and benefits of VBAC and then also repeat cesarean sections. So the biggest risk of VBAC that you'll hear is the chance of uterine rupture, which in the grand scheme of risk is not that high. It's 0.2 to 0.9%, depending on the literature that you read. Um, and the literature is interesting. Um, I won't get too far into it, but um, some of these studies didn't clarify if they use different induction methods, if they use other medication, um, where the parents were in their pregnancy of gestation. So there were a lot of factors that weren't always controlled for. So it's really hard to interpret some of that in information, but it's quite low. Um, then another risk is that a failed TOLAC or a failed tri trial of labor um, has more complications in general than an elective repeat cesarean section. Um, and I use the word fail because that's what's used in research. I have a hard time saying failure when it comes to birth. Um, neonatal mor morbidity is also higher with those um, failed TOLACs or um, emergency repeat cesarean sections than an elective. And then of course, there's the typical risks of vaginal birth, including perineal tearing. Some benefits, there are fewer maternal complications. Um, those include risk of hemorrhage, thromboembolism and infection. There's decreased risk of complication in future pregnancies. We talk about those placental abnormalities later. Um, they avoid major abdominal surgery. There's generally a shorter physical recovery and there's also a lower maternal mortality rate. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about uterine rupture. So a uterine rupture is a complete division of all three layers of the uterus. Um, Again, the literature is interesting where some of the literature puts in um, uterine windows and dehiscence in the same body of literature when they talk about uterine rupture, um, which there's no opening in the uterus, it's more of a thinning of the wall um, versus a uterine rupture is a complete division of those layers. Um, with a uterine rupture, part of the fetus, amniotic fluid, umbilical cord may enter the peritoneal cavity or the broad ligament. Signs and symptoms include abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, a change in the contraction pattern, and non-reassuring fetal heart rate tracing. The maternal mortality rate is 0.1%, and the neonatal mortality rate is a bit higher at 6 to 25%, again, depending on the research. The treatment for uterine rupture is an emergent cesarean section. Um, this is with general anesthesia. It's typically very quick um, if it's been discovered. And even with an epidural place, it'll be under general. Um, and there are things that put someone at higher risk for uterine rupture. These include different types of cesarean scars, so not the low transverse cesarean scar, but the inverted T, the J-shaped, and the classical incisions. Um, and then also use of um, prostaglandins, like mesoprostol, in um, an induction. Things that can decrease the chance of uterine rupture include having a prior vaginal birth. 
So some risks and benefits of repeat cesarean section. So the risks, as we talked a little bit about of the benefits of vaginal birth are increased maternal complications. There's an increased chance of complications in future pregnancies, including placenta creta spectrum disorders, um, increased maternal mortality, and it is a major abdominal surgery cutting through many layers. Benefits, the ability to plan for birth, decreased risk compared to the emergent repeat cesarean section, and then avoidance of that emergent repeat cesarean se section and the um, associated risks. So we'll talk more about these placenta accreta spectrum disorders. So they range in severity, and all of these are managed with a cesarean section prior to being full term. Um, it's when the placenta attaches too deeply into the uterine muscle with accreta and increta, it stays within the uterus and with percreta, it actually extends outside the uterus and can extend into nearby organs. So the placenta doesn't completely separate from the uterus after birth as it should and may lead to severe hemorrhage. This is associated with an elevated risk of maternal mortality and ne neonatal risks as well. Um, these are complicated deliveries typically that require a whole team approach um, in a large um, trauma setting. Um, the risk of accreta after two cesarean sections is 0.57%. So, and it increases with each subsequent cesarean section. Um, and just to compare that to the risk of uterine rupture after one prior cesarean section is 0.4%. So the risk of placenta accreta is higher than the risk of uterine rupture um, when just compared directly. So who are good candidates for VBAC? So this is of course decided between the provider and patient and can be a nuanced decision. Some factors that may improve the success rate include having only one prior cesarean, um, having a previous vaginal birth, perhaps with the first birth, and this is the third birth, um, having the low transverse incision rather than the other types of incisions, and that vaginal birth is not otherwise contraindicated. Um, this, is such as those placental abnormalities. And placenta previa, which I didn't touch on in the last slide, is when it's a low-lying placenta, so it's not um, deeply embedded into the uterus, but it is covering the cervix, which is making it impossible for the baby to descend um, into the cervix before the placenta. And that's also an indication for cesarean section. Um, the provider may use a VBAC calculator, which is controversial. Um, <clears throat> well, the VBAC calculator has not been validated in the research. Um, and some of the issues with that is that they people think that it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you're given, um, it gives you a success rate, uh, a chance of success, um, probably from 0% up to, I don't think I've seen 100, <laughs> but quite high. So if someone's given a 20% success rate for VBAC, it might make them think, well, there's no use. I, I'm not going to have this VBAC. 20% is not good. Um, and Providers may use this as a gatekeeping strategy. So, oh, I won't take anyone who's less than a 60 to 70% um, success chance. Um, and this is based on, we'll look at on the next slide, but BMI, age, and a few other factors. Um, other factors that may be considered by the provider include side of, size of their previous babies, um, gestation beyond 40 weeks, um, twins, which actually have similar success outcomes as singleton pregnancies, which is fantastic for VBAC. Um, and BMI. And all of these factors, actually ACOG um, supports feedback for um, large babies, gestation beyond 40 weeks. Those are not contraindications according to ACOG. And um, anecdotally, all of my children are above nine pounds and my VBAC babies were my largest. Um, my most recent feedback was um, he was nine pounds, 13 ounces. So he was a big baby <laughs> and it was my easiest birth. Um, it's totally anecdotal, anecdotal, but also he was 11 days after his due date. So he was certainly beyond the 40 weeks gestation as well. And my first feedback was three days beyond his due date. Um, so no, it's always going to be nuanced and person specific, you know, numbers and, and statistics aren't individual. So here's an example of the VBAC calculator. I screenshot of my mouse in it. Um, Interestingly, which I, I discovered actually when I was doing this presentation, is that they took a really controversial piece out of this calculator, which was the race piece. Um, that was based on some pretty questionable research and was, yeah, not well supported. And it pretty much, if you were anything other than white, it immediately decreased your success rate significantly, um, which would be a, a huge barrier potentially for anyone not white. Um, but we can look at age and years. They consider BMI again. 
arrest disorder, which is failure to progress, which actually was the primary reason for my cesarean was failure to progress. So that was a tick against me. <laughs> um, obstetric history. So did you have a vaginal birth or a VBAC? And then if there's chronic hypertension. So again, this is not validated by the research, but I know with both of my VBAC counseling experiences, this was brought out each time. Um, and my success chance was, of course, better the second time because I had a vaginal birth. <laughs> so how is it different? What makes VBAC different and how is it handled differently by providers? So induction and augmentation of labor. Um, some providers will not support induction or augmentation of labor, which means use of something to increase um, contractions um, or increase the pacing of labor, usually Pitocin. Um, ACOG supports the use of induction, but does recognize that it does increase the risk of uterine rupture. Um, and sorry, so, and we, they no use of cervical ripeners, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, prostaglandins are contraindicated except for um, in delivery of a second trimester loss. Um, they may require fetal monitoring, continuous fetal monitoring. We talked before about one of the signs of uterine rupture being the um, re non-reassuring fetal tracing and then also the change in contraction pattern. So that can be picked up pretty steadily. So many um, hospitals do require this. Um, anesthesia and analgesia actually should not be affected by somebody who's having a VBAC. ACOG states epidurals are not necessary for a VBAC, nor do they mask um, the signs of uterine rupture. So it should be up to the parent. They will need general anesthesia if there is an emergent repeat cesarean, so the epidural won't prevent that. And then also it may affect um, availability and supportive care for the parent. There are VBAC bans and there's restrictions out there. So I personally dealt with a feedback ban. Um, I birthed at my critical access hospital in, um, that was the one piece of knowledge I knew <laughs> for whatever reason that my hospital did not allow VBACs when I had my cesarean. I remember being wheeled back and knowing that if I wanted a second birth and I wanted to try for a VBAC, it couldn't be where I was birthing in that day. Um, and I knew I'd probably have to travel really far for it, unfortunately. Um, it should be noted that ACOG does not support VBAC bans. Um, respect for patient autonomy, they say it dictates that even if a place does not offer TOLAC, a policy cannot be used to force women to have a cesarean delivery or to deny care to women in labor. Uh, that's a law in, in our country. If a woman's in labor, um, you have to provide care for them and you also cannot force a procedure on somebody. Um, so an interesting statement in this, um, practice bulletin is that trial of labor after pre previous cesarean delivery should be attempted at facilities capable of performing emergency deliveries. This has been an interesting statement that's been, um, picked apart by different hospitals where they'll use as a reason to not support feedback, but also if you're support birth, then typically emergencies can happen in any birth, um, no matter if it's a primary vaginal birth or the fifth vaginal birth or a TOLAC. Um, so all hospitals that support labor generally support emergency deliveries. Some challenges for a VBAC hopeful patient. Fear. I would say fear is the biggest thing. Um, there is often a VBAC consent form and a whole process. I was um, required, I guess, is a loose term because I'm sure I could have de declined it, but required to meet with maternal fetal medicine to consult with um, them about VBAC both times, um, even though I was low risk on the scale of everybody, including maternal fetal medicine, who seemed very confused as to why I was there. Um, <laughs> and I had to fill out a consent form and the consent form each time focused more on the risks of VBAC rather than any risks of repeat cesarean section. They also spoke with me at length um, as this pregnant person about the risk of fetal death um, in VBAC and uterine rupture. Um, and I left those appointments well, the first time, not the second time. I knew what to expect the second time. But the first time I left in tears and I think I cried the entire two hour drive home. It was really upsetting, even for someone like me who works in healthcare. Um, and I was well informed. I went in with my my papers of research and I knew. And even with all of that, um, it was a really scary consultation. So I can only imagine what other people feel when they go through it. 
So with that, finding a supportive provider in place of birth can be really challenging. I did not want to see that provider again. Um, gratefully, there was another provider. So I did have to keep working with maternal and fetal medicine. It was the policy of this um, hospital as a VBAC parent who lived out of town that I had to work with maternal fetal medicine. And the second one was incredibly supportive and believed in my ability. And I had a wonderful experience. Um, but it took going through that to get to her. <laughs> um, and again, support from partner, family, and friends, they likely are experiencing the same fear. Um, I know my mom did not understand why I was choosing this and why can't I just have another repeat cesarean? Wouldn't that be safer? Um, I just stopped talking to her about it <laughs> because I had done my research, but it was hard to not have that full support. Gratefully, I had my partner, but um, it can be a challenge. And then pressure from providers. There may be pressure to go into labor spontaneously. There might be pressure with interventions, other criteria that they have, um, whether it's rooted in research or not. Um, they may require certain criteria to support a VBAC. There may be an increased financial strain. So they may have to seek out of network care for support and may require more travel for, for support. Like me, I travel two hours both times for my VBACs. Um, and challenging to find high quality information that's not rooted in fear, that's rooted in statistics and research and, and neutral. Uh, there's a lot of kind of scary things if you just Google VBAC. So some tips. Find a supportive and not tolerant provider. Uh, that's some a provider that really believes in your ability to VBAC. If it's safe, of course. If, if that decision has already been made, there's no placental um, abnormality. There's there's no other reason. And, and it's something that the client wants. Say no to prostaglandins or cervical ripening. They shouldn't be offered. Um, it's pretty clearly contraindicated. Um, aim for spontaneous labor. Um, limit Pitocin. Work with a doula, which have been known to um, increase the chance of success of the vaginal birth. Birth spacing greater than 18 months from birth to birth may decrease risk and increase support as well, because that's sometimes the criteria that providers have. And of course, these are just general tips to discuss with the provider. There are certainly indications for induction and Pitocin. I actually had Pitocin with my first feedback. Um, my second feedback, it was fast and furious and there was no time for anything. <laughs> but my first one was a bit different. Um, it was a long labor. Um, I was planning an unmedicated birth and he was actually positioned posteriorly. So he was sunny side up um, versus he should be the other way, which can make for potentially a more challenging labor and delivery experience. Um, and I hit actually about the same wall in my labor as I did in my first labor. It was a really interesting experience to have the same hang up um, for me. And I ended up getting an epidural to try to see if that would help. And then my labor slowed. So I had Pitocin and I was able to have a feedback after it was a lot of work as birth always is, no matter which way it goes. Um, but I was able to have Pitocin and had a really good feedback experience. Some patient re resources. So there's ICANN. It's an international cesarean awareness network. There's a website. They have support groups um, in all different areas of the country and the world. It's international. Um, VBAC Facts is another really great resource. It's a website. Um, I believe she has courses as well. There's the VBAC link, which is a doula owned company. They have a blog, website, podcast. Evidence-based birth is a more general birth um, resource. However, they do have a lot of really great VBAC resources um, and is rooted in research, hence the name. <laughs> and then there's the practice bulletin. Um, it's not free but um, providers should have access to it. And it's not patient-centered, um, but it gives all the details of what many providers base their practice on. So for somebody who's really interested in learning more, um, it might be a really good resource for them. And I, the point that I really like to make is that in the research, it clearly states that 60 to 80% of people who attempt a VBAC will be successful. That's a really high success rate and certainly has been my experience as well. Um, I had a wonderful VBAC experience and I was so grateful that I made that choice. Um, and I hope that others are given the same choice, whether they choose repeat cesarean or VBAC, that is an informed decision that they're able to make and support it in that decision. So those are my references and that's me.